This is Deborah Vogel, and you're listening to the Studio Success Formula Podcast. Well, welcome to the Studio Success Formula Podcast, the business school for dance studio owners. And now for your host, Clint Salter. Hello, dance studio owners. It's Clint Salter here from Studio Success Formula, and thank you for joining us on another episode that I know is going to have a great impact on your studio and your students and teachers. I'm always on the hunt to bring you great people with great ideas who know the dance world. And today, that's exactly what you're getting. Our guest today is an author, academic, and co-founder of the Center of Dance Medicine in New York City. She's known for her work, the work that she does with dancers, so that they can get the most out of their bodies while minimizing injury risks. She's written multiple books and products on improving the dancer's technique, such as Tune Up Your Turnout and Essential Anatomy. Please welcome our guest on the show today, Deborah Vogel. Hi, Deborah. Hello, Clint. I am so excited to be a part of your show. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. Now, Deborah, I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit how you got into this line of work and why you decided to focus on dancers. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sure my mother and father weren't surprised that I ended up in the arena of dance and movement studies, as I probably would have been diagnosed as an ADHD child if that diagnosis had been (laughs) around when I was growing up. It was really hard for me to sit still, unless... I had my nose in a book, and then the world around me sort of faded away. Um, so my my mother did a very intelligent thing, and she put me into dance classes, and I danced through my younger school years. And then when it became time to go off to college, I thought, okay, now I have to get real and find something to do that's a real career. And I went through multiple majors, psychology, social work, teaching. Um, Wow. But the dance classes I was taking always kept me sane. There was just something magical um, about dance. And so I decided, okay, I've got to look at this. And I went away to New York in my junior year and had such a positive experience that I came back and I told my mom and dad that, uh, mom and dad, I I, I just have to do this. Um, I, I don't want to live my life and say, what if I you know, I I didn't want to look back and have any regrets. And, and they knew me well enough. And I promised that I would finish my academic degree, which actually was a good thing because I went off to New York and in the process of, of looking how I could finish my, my degree, um, I found uh, a SUNY college and I started doing many classes that were either independent study or um, I found Irene Dowd, who became actually my mentor in this field. She's a neuromuscular specialist, and I was taking anatomy from her, and she taught me how to see the body. And that was amazing. I would sit in Grand Central Station, and I would just watch people. And you can tell so much as a person is just walking across the floor about what's going on in their body. You can tell about their emotional or mental state. You know, are they gimping? Do they only have one side that moves? I mean, people are fascinating. So that was sort of the start of of going in um, towards these anatomical studies. And I finished my college degree with um, a BS in dance anatomy. And then went to work on anybody and everybody I could get my hands on because it was so interesting. And lo and behold, I got called by a doctor, Dr. Richard Backrack, who was um, quite the dance doc at that time in the city. And he asked me if I'd come and I became part of his practice. Um, And it was without, you know, multiple medical degrees. I was a educator. I took the information of what the dancers were doing because I understood them from the inside out. And I was a teacher. And now I'm I'm facilitating rehab. So it was just, I mean, dancers are are my people. Yeah, <laughs> they're, exactly. They're I think amazingly, you know, yeah. yeah, and you and you speak their language. 
as well, which I think is really important. Yes. And it's been important to me that even though um, I I, I stopped dancing when I was in my 40s, you know, stage dancing, but I've always maintained teaching because I think think that as a teacher you it's it's like the studio in that class becomes your canvas and you so quickly begin to see what works and what doesn't and I don't think I ever want to stop teaching I love helping people but I always want to do it in not in a therapist way but in an educational way I want to be an educator. Yeah, very, very important. Now you've touched on dance teachers this then, just then, but I'd love to know what are the the big mistakes or some of the mistakes that you see dance teachers and studio owners making when it comes to training our dancers and performers of tomorrow? Okay. Um, A common mistake I see is teaching our students what worked for us. We all learn through experience, and frankly, that's called wisdom. But the the challenge in teaching dance for most of us is that we have multiple types of bodies in our classrooms. Most of us don't have that ideal um, body with that long, lean, flexible, strong, and more than average turnout. Um, Those aren't the students that most of the studio owners have as as their general population. So, so many of our classes are filled with, with students who have average turnout or even more turn-in than turnout, um, but have a great desire and determination. And what I found that at first, I was teaching to feel, well, it should feel like this. Well, the truth is, depending on what your body is like, it might feel different. If you are a loosey-goosey dancer, how it feels is going to be different from someone who's really tight and wiry. So you've got to be careful, one, not to teach feeling, which is why I like to teach from an anatomical basis. You you can talk, talk about bones and muscles and, and, and joints and, um, and, and flexion, just range, and also to be aware that if what I suggest that worked for me isn't working for them, then I need to find another way because clearly they have a different patterning than what I have. So, so that's one really, really common mistake. Um, I think often it's hard to determine whether or not we're overtraining our students without enough intentional rest or recovery time. I mean, some students are going, they go to school here in the States, the bus might pick them up at seven o'clock in the morning. And then after school, they go straight to the studio and they work till nine or so. Then they go home and and they have homework. I mean, it's a grueling schedule. Um, I also realize that Teachers often are overwhelmed by their own schedule. So this this idea of recovery, I think, isn't honored as as much um, as it should be, perhaps. Exactly. I think it's a very foreign concept for many studio owners that are probably listening to this interview as well. <laughs> right. Well, and, and the fact is when, when we're rested, if we get good sleep, if we're properly hydrated, if our students are feeding themselves well with, with good nutrition, their, their dancing is going to improve. I mean, people injure themselves if you watch a football game or a soccer game. When are the injuries happening? at the end of the game. It's when they're becoming dehydrated, when they're becoming fatigued, right? So these are are elements of our training that I think we need to be careful and aware of. I I don't know how much the, the listeners know about fascia, but something really interesting, when I when I discovered that fascia, fascia is connective tissue. Fascia is the lining of every muscle. It's like a glove. If you put your hand into the glove, the glove is the fascia. You don't necessarily feel it, um, but it surrounds the muscles. Well, fascia is 85, approximately 85% water. And if you're dehydrated, that means that your fascia isn't bending and moving smoothly. It's like a dry sponge that when you try to twist, 
it might crack instead of a nice moist sponge that when you twist, you can, you know, drain the water um, out of well. So um, when I started understanding that, I started talking to my students going, are you having problems with your flexibility? How much water are you drinking? It's possible that if they increase their, their hydration, that actually their flexibility, and certainly if they have any like disc problems or problems in their spine, could improve only because they are now properly hydrated, which, Clint, it takes six weeks of consistent hydration to become fully hydrated. So you can't do it for three days and then not drink over the weekend. <laughs> we, all then, want, you know, we all want the back. magic pill, though, Deborah. We all want the quick <laughs> fix, don't we? We want the one day of drinking a lot of water to fix all of our problems, not six weeks. I know. I know. Well, that, that was so amazing to me. And I wasn't, frankly, for myself, I wasn't sure how much water was I drinking. So I had to go get a... Um, Oh, what do you call those things that a pitcher that had uh, measurements on the side and I filled it up in the morning and then I poured that into my Nalgene, into my water bottle. So I could see, was I getting consistent um, hydration? And I'll tell you, a lot of our teenage students, their, their face, their skin will improve too, because a lot of them are just you know, their skin is dehydrated as well as their muscles. So when I talk to them about hydration and their flexibility, especially if they're tight, hmm, all of a sudden they start to listen go, oh, okay, you know, and, and they start to drink more water. And you can put fruit or lemon in it or cucumber water is really nice. Or if you need a little bit of sweetness, do a couple drops of stevia to, to give it a little taste, but there's nothing like water. Juice isn't water. Coffee is dehydrating. I mean, water is water. That's water what is need. water. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> yeah, that exactly wasn't very right. brilliant, but, but you understand. Oh no, I, I, I totally, I totally agree, agree with you because you can try and disguise it in as many ways as possible, but at the end of the day, <laughs> just put water in a glass and drink it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's right. That's right. And I wonder if there, if, if people who say, well, I just don't like the taste, if they can start to actually become better hydrated, if their whole relationship with, um, that doesn't change because, you know, now when you're feeling better, you want to keep doing the things that are working. So, you know, you can kind of change your um, perspective sometimes about certain new habits if you're getting the results that you want. Exactly. And like you said, you know, six weeks. So six yeah. weeks to get hydrated. So give yourself six weeks of drinking water and then decide how you feel. That's right. That's right. Um, I'd, I'd love to go, you know, I loved what you said about overtraining because mm -hmm. I don't think that it's something we talk about often. And I think that it's something that needs to be spoken about because uh, e everywhere around the world, you know, we've got a lot of our members in the US, we've got members in Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, it's not uncommon for, like you said, children to be getting up early, going to school, going to dance class at, you know, 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon and staying there until basically it's bedtime and then having to go home and go home and do homework. I mean, how do we know, how do we assess if we are overtraining our students? Well, in a, in a studio, one thing you can look at is the pattern of injuries. And, and injuries are small as well as big. An injury is not just something that takes you out of commission so you can't dance anymore. I mean, you can tweak the an ankle. You can start to feel strain. I mean, first of all, if we realize the body is made for movement, and we teach our students that pain and discomfort, they're indicators that something's going on that needs to be balanced out. So it's not that they're doing things bad or, or wrong, just that they're out of whack. So if we can, one, get them to begin to start paying attention to some of the um, smaller indicators that they're starting to feel stressed. It could be that they start getting cold and their immune system is no longer able. That's a fatigue, right? It could be that they're starting to feel really 
tired after that first class because I see students that have three classes in a row, they have to save themselves, right? If they, they can't give it all in that first class because they'll never make it through to the third to the third class. And, you know, if you're a professional dancer, at least your whole day is broken up into you have that really good company class. You're not taking 18 classes over the course of the, the, the week. You've got that company class in the morning. Then you might have rehearsal, but rehearsal is usually not nonstop. I mean, the professional um, dance career is very challenging, but it's usually broken up in ways so you're not going, you know, full tilt boogie all all uh, day long. So I think that if we can let our students know that those small little shifts and, and changes really are signs that they need to rest. I mean, I, I love taking full days off, you know, full days off, not full weeks and weeks, but really, you know, disengage, go out play <laughs> be in the sun yeah it, it, exactly exactly and it I think this comes down to really education I think it's the teacher and the studio owner being educated to then pass that knowledge on to their students and so that brings me to my next question which okay. is about how you really learn how you can teach anatomy in a way that's engaging that's fun because if I remember back in my day of doing anatomy in my physical education classes you know it wasn't too entertaining or exciting so how how do you you know how do you tell how do you teach other teachers and studio owners to pass on this knowledge to their students? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Good, good question. Um, well, I love having, you, you can purchase these small hanging uh, skeletons that may only be like three feet tall. Having some little props around are really a nice um, addition to a, a studio. And then doing bite size, little explorations. I don't even want to call them lessons. Um, Little explorations can really begin to educate them about their body and explore it at the same time. So for example, using a a pinky ball, uh, which is just a dense rubber ball and, you know, sitting on it and rolling and you can begin to talk about, well, here are the turnout muscles. Do you feel, you know, do you have any sore spots and they're rolling around on it? And now I want you to sit and turn your legs out. And then in, put your hands right where you were rolling on the pinky ball. Do you feel a muscle engaging? That's your lateral turnout muscles. And so trying to integrate the information immediately into their experience, I think is, is really good. So you could take a look at the foot. Actually, Annalisa Burns, Wilson, and I co-wrote um, a three-level functional anatomy for dancer um, series. And in functional fun, F-U-N is capitalized because I, I do think that it has to be engaging. And one of the first lessons is, you know, showing them looking at the foot. Look at the foot is arches. And look at these three points. And now can you stand up and let's roll back and forth on our feet. So you can feel those points. And now can you stand and have it equal between the front and the back and the sides of your feet and have them just doing exploration and not doing a whole class, but five five minutes and just little, you know, keep going at it. Yeah. And in something, like you said, I like how you said about, you know, basing it around the experience that they're having as well. So it's not like, okay, everyone time for anatomy class. It's, this is what we're doing. And now it's integrating, I guess, the teaching into the class. That's right. And you can use the proper terms. Like I love teaching a, a eight-year-old how to say ischial tuberosity. They love it instead of saying sits bone or the bum. You know, no, you're sitting on these rockers. You can show them on the skeleton. They're called ischial tuberosity. And, you know, it's, it's a funny word. Fun. But they, yeah, they love but that. They, they love that. Learning. Yeah. You could make they a song. That. You could make a song out of that for them. <laughs> Well, you might be able to make a song. <laughs> I'm not sure I could. 
<laughs> Excellent. No, that that's yeah. that's really good. Uh, that's really good advice. Now, I was fascinated when I was doing some reading about you that you use kinesiology in your work. So, I'd love for you to explain what kinesiology is to our audience and how you use it when working with dancers. Okay. Well, kinesiology is simply the study of human movement. All right. Dance teachers, I think, make wonderful kinesiologists because they're always analyzing alignment and looking at how someone's moving. My teaching changed the more anatomical and muscular information I learned. Um, It helped me uh, become better as basically a movement analyst or a kinesiologist, even though that is not my degree. There's a whole study that you can come out and go, I have this kinesiology degree. But kinesiology is just that study of human movement. So I'm checking often, well, there are certain things that I think that dance teachers should know how to do. They should know how to assess some basic joints to find out like what is actually the turnout at the hip for that person. And then, so I would do that and then I might watch them actually use their first position and see, does it match up with what I just tested? So there are certain assessments that I would do at the beginning of the semester. And actually, this is something that I think studio owners would really appreciate doing if they had the the simplest of assessments. Let's look at what the range of motion is. Let's look at your hamstrings and your quadriceps. Let's look at a little bit of strength. You know, how well can you jump and use the gastroc and soleus? Just a few markers. And then test again at the end of your 12, 13 weeks, whatever your first semester is. What's important about that is you can see if there's a change, but even more important, the dancer can tell are they improving or not and then you can make some choices because if they're not getting the improvement and they're doing x y and z well then we need to try something different because you're not getting the results from what you're doing currently instead we just go oh well i'll stretch harder you know or i'll just you know and and that doesn't work. So it, it kind of makes things easier to 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 figure out. And that's you know, that's the the study of kinesiology. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And I think the great thing about that is testing it, you know, at the beginning and then at, then at the end of the twelve or thirteen weeks is that mm-hmm. they're working towards something. There there's those mm-hmm. steps of progression, which I think we all need as dancers or general human beings. Um, you know, yes. that ability to grow and learn. And and what I love about the check-in is that most people just continue what they're doing and expect different results. Where with That's this, right. you know, where with this, you know, there, there's a check-in going, okay, I've been doing this for 12 weeks, uh, you know, and I've been doing the consistent action daily to get to the point that I need to and nothing's changed. So then you can sit down with that student and have a conversation about, okay, this is this is our, our new plan moving forward. Because like you've said quite a bit in this interview, not one thing is going to work for everyone. And that's I right. think that's that's such that's key with being a, a dance teacher, with being a studio owner, is having the ability to to recognize and accept that. Absolutely, you said that beautifully. I didn't even ha- <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even have that written down. <laughs> Amazing. Now you, we've spoken about you know injury. I would love you to talk about. How you've seen the the injuries of a dancer change over the years that you've been doing this type of work? So maybe when you first started getting into this and started working with dancers, what type of injury were you seeing then, and how has that changed now? Or is it, or are you seeing the same injuries? I'm probably seeing the same injuries. I mean, there's uh, depending on the the age of the dancer. There are a lot of growing injuries in adolescent bodies that are changing because we know that bone grows faster than muscles. So you have this awkward period. Um, that's when, you know, young boys who are starting to shoot up all of a sudden get that, the tendonitis just underneath the knee, patellar tendonitis, because they're, they're spurting up, but their muscles haven't lengthened and they're still 
jumping and jumping and jumping and, and something's got to give. So all throughout, I think that adolescence is a vulnerable time. I think it's, it's often when dancers go, well, this just hurts or it's not fun anymore. And, and I think that there's an attrition that happens around that time that studio owners, you know, could be aware of, um, so that they may have to change a little bit as they're going through that, that growth spurts, but you know, knees, ankles, low backs, those those are the injuries. Well, and hip, but hip, low back kind of work together. And there there's that myth that n- no pain, no gain. And that's just not right. I mean, pain is always an indicator from the body that something is not working well. So I, ju- I don't think you have to suffer in order to be a professional dancer. I think you can dance smart and um, not just dance hard. You know, I think that you don't have to deform your feet and get bunions and bunionettes and have ugly feet just by virtue of, of being a dancer. No, you know what? That's not even genetic. Bunions are not genetic. Bunions are, are caused by improper placement of weight on the feet. Injuries have remained pretty much the same. I think we're smarter about them now. I think we have more knowledge out there about how to address injuries and, and, and rehab and prevent them. So a lot more now than when I was uh, training as a younger dancer. Awesome. And what are some, you know, if there's any kind of prevention tips for, you know, injury, I mean, that's kind of a broad question, but is there anything that you can pass on to the, to the studio owners, to the dance teachers that they can pass on to their students? For prevention tips. Okay. To one, be aware that when they're noticing things, it doesn't, these aren't things that are wrong. Okay. It doesn't mean that they're bad and they're, they're not working. Well, they might not be working as efficiently. Um, but that these are, again, they've got to learn how to somatically translate what they're feeling in, in the body tips. If they're noticing it, something in one area of the body, pay attention to what else the body is saying, because our, our body is in relationships. So if you hurt your knee or you tweak your ankle, immediately the body will shift to the other uninjured side to compensate and to try to protect. All right. So now you're standing over there and the tweak gets better, but you've never come back from the compensation. So I think to um, always be working towards a dynamic, fluid-centered balance is going to be your best prevention um, of, of injuries. And do you suggest that, you know, because dancers, you know, as they get older, they might start going to a health club or a gym and start working out and using weights. Mm-hmm. I mean, what are mm-hmm. your what are your suggestions for, you know, a, a teenage dancer who maybe wants a career um, as mm-hmm. a performer? I mean, should they be doing that? What, what types of kind of other strengthening activities should they be doing to really prepare their body for uh, uh, longevity, basically? Right. Well, I love that question because actually going to the gym for some of them, if they need to develop um, more stability and more strength, let's say, then to cross train and to do a, a slow weight workout right? It doesn't have to be your loading. You could do more repetitions or do them slowly and really begin to gain strength in a muscle group so that it is strong enough to do what it is that you're asking it to do, right? That's when our our muscles get fatigued. That's kind of helps us find out, well, where do we need to focus? I love my dancers cross training. I love it if once a week or twice a week they'd go to the pool and do a nice long swimming session. What are they doing? Cardiovascularly fueling the body. Muscles need oxygen. They need that um, that cardiovascular fitness that helps our muscles. You know, doing some cross training, doing Pilates, which is both working on uh, strength and flexibility is a dynamic program. Uh, gyro, I, gyros, is gyro in Australia a lot of gyrokinesis and gyrotonics working on the spirals of no, the body? I've heard of it, but, but I'm not overly aware of it. 
Okay. It's, it's a beautiful form because it, it works the body in spirals and we have spirals in our movement. So it's really nice to be working in this three dimensional form. So I am a great believer in cross training because it also keeps your muscles from being too fatigued. You, you keep changing it up and you want your body to be adaptable, especially in this day and age where your choreography may be a classical, traditional ballet, and it may be some funky, weird, contemporary thing that you're on your hands and flipping over backwards. I mean, you, your body's got to be able to do it all. Exactly. And dancers uh, need to be able to do it all these days as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, for sure. Look, it, it's been awesome talking with you, Deborah. I'd love to hear one last piece of advice uh, from you for our studio owners out there who want to be building lifelong dancers. All right. I, I would say to them to remember that learning is a process and not a product. So that process we're engaging with with our student and, and our job is to actually empower them to become their own best teacher. And, and that means that we need to engage with them, not just in a do this or look like me, but to have them become better at reflecting at what's working well, and what's not, and how could they try it differently. So to really facilitate uh, them in learning about uh, their their body and their movement um, so that they can really own that experience. And when they can do that, then they will become lifelong movers because it just feels good. They're empowering themselves. Yeah, excellent. I love it. I love that learning is a process, not a product. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, wow, great, great conversation. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. If our listeners want to get some more details on you, Deborah, and your work, where can they go? Have you got a website that they can go to? Yes, I have actually two. I have thebodyseries.com, which has all the products, and, and, and there's a blog. Dancer and teachers can email me questions that I respond to in my blog. And also, I'm doing a conference, um, and it's called Optimal Performance Dance. Com. And they could go to that website and learn about what I'll be offering this summer. Fantastic. And when, when about is the conference? The conference is July, is it 23rd through 26th at, on a college campus. So it's going to be really less expensive and I'm it's going to be all about integrating information. So very intimate, very small, and I'm very excited about it. Fantastic. Sounds great. Thanks again, Deborah. Fantastic to speak with you today. Thank you, Clint. If you want more strategies to grow your dance studio, we have something awesome we want to send you. It's a four-part video training series on how you attract, enroll, and retain more students in your dance studio. You won't find this information anywhere else. As one of our listeners, we'd love to give you this video training series absolutely free. You can get access to the video training right now by going to attractstudentstoday.com. Take care, and we'll see you next time.